Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speakers Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Tim, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, this is a one-hour speaker meeting that starts every Saturday night, St. Paul's Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street, Dolestown, PA. We record all speakers so if others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that'd like to introduce themselves with their first name? Sir. My name is Ted, I'm an alcoholic. Welcome, Ted. Yes, sir. Welcome, Henry. Yes, ma'am. Lisa, welcome. John, welcome. Sir. Steve, welcome. Pat, welcome to our meeting. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Welcome. Got them all? Okay. If you have any questions or would like to make this your home group, please see me or any group member after the meeting. The Conscious Contact Speakers Group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone who has the working knowledge of the 12 steps and is willing to sponsor please raise your hand now? Thank you. Are there any announcements for the good of the AA? We have, we have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. A lot of that information is located in the back of the room. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker will be happy to give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to make donations for the purchase of big books, CDs, or other things can place it in the jar in the back. If you'd like a CD of any speaker, past or present, please see me or Ron after the meeting. They are available free of charge. We always need help, so if you'd like to get involved with this meeting or this group, Please see me or Ron after the meeting. I now would like to introduce Lori, who will read the preamble to our meeting. Hi, everybody. <laughs> My name is Lori. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Lori. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy. Neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. John, John's going to go up next and read the steps, the 12 steps. Good evening. My name's John, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, these are the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, excuse me, three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. We have the seventh, the seventh tradition here. Each AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, excuse me, declining outside contributions. At this time, I'd like to pass the basket on either side of the room. We have no dues or fees, but we do have expenses, the coffee, the cream, the donuts, the ham sliders, the big books, the CDs, etc. There is absolutely no smoking on the church property. They've been very adamant about that. Please, please, please. Also, if you wouldn't mind, please take a moment now and silence your phones. Either turn them off or hit the mute button. They can be a very incredible distraction to our speaker. 
It's now my pleasure to introduce to you the speaker for tonight. He's a very good friend of the Conscious Contact Speakers Group. Mr. Dan McHugh, come to us from Wilmington, Delaware, courtesy of the Fresh Air Group. Dan, thank you, sir. My name's Dan McHugh, I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here. I like to name your group. My group's the Fresh Air Group. Your group, the Conscious Contact, you know, that's a, that's a huge saying, something we think deeply about in AA, and it's in the 11th step, and it's got spiritual meaning to it. My group, the Fresh Air Group, didn't have a spiritual start. In Delaware, there used to be smoking in the meetings down there, and a big fight broke out when they start, you know, people started, you know, getting healthy and all those things. And they were arguing about smoking in the meetings anymore and it caused a big ruckus and the meeting split. And the, the health nuts went over and started their own meeting across the hall and called it the Fresh Air Group. So it just started with a big resentment, you know, and the whole thing. <laughs> so my home group's not, not like yours. I'm fascinated by the names of groups sometimes. You know, it's, I wonder if you guys even, your group called Conscious Con if you even think about what's, what's that, what that means and what it's meant over the years in 12-step recovery and well before 12-step recovery, that phrase was around. We have a group in, in Newark, or not Newark, Delaware, but just outside down in Delaware now. It's called the Atheists Group. I haven't seen that one before. And I just thought, well, you know, to each his own. But I found something fascinating. I saw a flyer on our inner group thing the other day, and it said, the atheist group meeting will be closed Christmas Day. <laughs> and, I, I, I just didn't really get that. But you know, we are many and varied. Um, I'm happy to be here. I, I used to be able to do a lot more uh, visiting groups and getting a yak in front of people and all that, but my work is such these days that I just don't have the time this last year or two. So when I get a chance to get out, I, I just love it and drive up here and see some old friends and see you guys. It's, it's fantastic. And talk about this program that's meant so much to me. You know, the fact that my work keeps me so busy when I'm a guy, I'm, I'm sober uh, a little over 22 years continuously. and. When I came in here, I literally was unemployable. I mean, I'd lost uh, everything. Some of you guys I know, and you know my story, and it, and it wasn't pretty. And it, do we have three, four hours tonight? Because I can go through the, the whole thing. But I don't have one of these stories that's fun, and you know, I stole buses and drove them off mountains, or large groups of nuns, or any of the. Well, I'm standing in front of that thing. I, I, I don't have that kind of a story, so I can't, you know, I'm sorry if you came for that. It just, I'm, I'm a drunk. I'm a drunk who mostly drinks alone, and I'm a drunk who drank abnormally from day one. I, I, I know some people seem to have, like their alcoholism just kind of popped up along the way or they drank into it. I drank more than everyone around me right from the beginning. Never understood it. I just figured I'm a bum. I mean, that's what everybody would tell me over the years. I'm no good. You know, I'm a lousy husband. I'm a lousy father. I'm a lousy boss. I'm a lousy employee. I believed them. What else? I didn't know why I drank the way I drank. And over the years, through the high school of course, back then, I became a daily drinker by probably somewhere around my senior year of high school, and it started to cause a lot of damage in my life. It hurt me getting into college. Then, you know, a couple of fine colleges politely asked me to reconsider and perhaps go somewhere else. So that whole thing got messed. But I did end up getting into a family business, and we built the business up. And somehow or other, I managed for a while. I'm sure a lot of you guys in the room can, can identify. I managed to keep it going somehow for a while until I couldn't anymore. And as I drank, my world shrank. Does, does that make sense to you guys? I mean, you know, I had all this here. And then as I continued to drink daily, it just shrank and shrank and shrank and shrank. And I would chase people away out of my life and hate them for leaving. Does that ring a bell? I'd resent them. I'd say, you know, just get. And then when they'd go, I'm, I'm resenting them. My thinking was just. Now, some say, you know, some of us say, well, I was always born with wacko thinking. Or I developed wacko thinking over the years. Or I drank myself into wacko thinking. 
I don't know what it is. I, I don't even know if it matters anymore. But by the time I got here, my thinking was pretty out of whack. It was very, very out of whack. So I drank and I drank, and of course the business ultimately would go, and the family ultimately would go, and all the friends and, and everything in my life, one by one by one, just disappeared. I got madder and madder and madder. I blamed them. It's not my fault. I'm not going to look at my drinking. Until I, I, until I got here, and, and it was just a tight, solid, little, hateful, alone world. That's what got me into AA. My, my story of getting sober, it's entertaining. I'm, I, I won't tell the full story tonight, uh, only because we can't stay here for the next three hours. But I eventually got to a point where I, I did seek help. Everyone was gone. And I did reach out to AA. I had heard about AA from someone who tried to 12-step me a couple years prior. That person got drunk with me that night, drunk to this day, uh, by himself that night. But the, uh, I would come to AA. I would go to a, a detoxification unit. I was very, very ill physically because, you know, you drink that much. It, it beats you up pretty bad. And then I, I didn't like those accommodations, and I, I tried to break out. And I, when I did break out of the institution, but I hurt myself badly and ended up in a wheelchair and beat up and long story short, into a rehab where they kind of pumped me up with nutrients and mentioned things like Alcoholics Anonymous and the big book. I said, what is all this stuff? And they said, when you get out of here, you're going to need to go find yourself a 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, if you have any hope at all. And I did. I came to you guys. Beat up crazy with a world like this with really <laughs> wacky thinking. Thinking about it as I drove up here, I had an hour and a half drive, I was thinking, you know, I guess whenever you get to, to talk about this stuff, you kind of remember the earlier days, you know. We, we've had, in my era, I don't know about up here, we have had a rash of losing people lately with alcohol and other stuff that's out there in the world. And it just seems to me that an awful lot of folks, a lot of younger folks, are coming to us but maybe not staying. Now, maybe they found another way, and I sincerely hope all these people coming in have found some other way. I mean, it, that's wonderful. But I suspect for a large amount of those folks that's not the case. Either they're coming here and I guess maybe not quite ready yet, or maybe they're not seeing anything that attracts them, or maybe somebody like myself isn't explaining things well to them. I don't know, but we've had a rash of it, and it's maddening. It's maddening. And just today, uh, another one, I almost thought I was going to have to call Ron and, and say, I don't think I can make it tonight because of someone very close to my family uh, made, some, made some decisions that, that are going to kill him um, if something doesn't change. What does that all have to do with conscious contact and coming up here and the holiday season and all that? Everything, the way I see it, the way my mind was when I got in here. I was very, very fortunate when I got here in that I met some guys who took me aside and showed me 12-step recovery. And they were very clear about the things I needed to do. And the first thing they all, we all harp on is meeting at 10. You're going to have to get to a meeting. You have to go to a meeting every single day. My sponsor, he would tell me to go. He, he never really said go to a meeting every day. He'd say, attend a meeting on the days you don't want to drink. You know, sponsors say stuff like, there's like a book of these sponsor things somewhere. I got. I can't find, I don't have the book yet, but all these wise things they say, there, there has to be one of these books floating around. But he would say stuff like that. I remember I'm sober a year, year and a half, and I said to him, I said, Mike, I'm going to a meeting every day. You know, my life is coming back. Do I really need to? He says, no, 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 no. start cutting back. He says, start cutting back your meetings, and then when you wake up and detox, add one back on, you know? <laughs> it's... But he, he, he encouraged me to go to the meetings, and he encouraged me to get with you guys. And he said, that fellowship is going to feel fantastic. And it did when I started hanging around. But he also cautioned me. He said, you know, you're thinking when your life was like this, and it was just anger and fear and all these things many of us feel when we get in here. He said, I'm afraid that attending a meeting with our fellowship every day is probably not going to be enough for a guy like you. He said, a guy like you is going to have to learn a whole new way of, of seeing life, a whole new way of living. It's where that whole conscious contact idea comes from. I, I like to look at the history and the influence of our 12-step recovery. We've been around, I don't know, 70-something years, whatever it is now. But we didn't just fall out of the sky. There was hundreds, thousands of years of influence 
and things that worked for people, not necessarily to recover from alcoholism, but folks would develop these different things we might put in our life to live more comfortably. That's where most of these spiritual programs will come from. Folks are saying, you know what, life, there's got to be more to it. Life has got to be more comfortable than this. Something bad happens and I, are you like me, when something good happens, I can ruin it real fast. And when something bad happens, I can make it worse real fast. The way my thinking was when I first got in here, that was the way I lived. Incredibly uncomfortable. And there is no way that that guy, even sitting in a meeting with you every day, there's no way that guy thinking like that, like I was, is going to remain sober. I have a theory today. Maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. An awful lot of people come to us and leave. Maybe some of us in this room did that. Maybe some of us in this room did it multiple, multiple, multiple times. Maybe some of us are going to do it yet. I don't know. I used to think that when folks would leave AA, it's because they wanted to be drunk. I don't believe that anymore. I'm sure some do. But I suspect folks who leave us do so because they can't stand being sober. And drunk, as bad as it is, is a better alternative in their minds. Do we remember that? I, I can remember. You know, when I was still drinking, thinking about sobriety was worse than whatever I was, whatever I was, I was in the middle of drunk. That seemed like a worse option to me. So I wonder sometimes if a lot of folks, and maybe some of us right here today, kind of feel like this just isn't working. I'm abstinent, but I'm so uncomfortable. This time of year, the holiday time, the Christmas, all this stuff, when I drank was I hated this time of year, hated it. I had made so many problems in family life. This is a family time of year, uh, friends, you know, groups of people kind of year, and I had damaged all that. I'm the guy that they're all sitting home thinking, I hope he doesn't find out we're having that party Saturday night. I'm that guy. I'm that guy that they're all saying, It'd be fine if he would just come and stay a while and leave. They can't get me out of there once I'm there. And I got to pick a fight with everybody and this, I'm just so angry. I just, I'm that guy. So when I got in here, you know, Christmas men or the holidays for me meant I had to have some money for other people. Well, I don't, I'm not particularly interested in other people. You know, I'm trying to make sure I got what I got because I'm angry and I'm mad and my world's like this and that's all there is to it. Now today, it's my, I love this time of year. It's been a while, it didn't happen overnight. Like I said, it's been you know, over 22 years that I've been working on this thing. Now, this, everything about holiday time and family time, and they want me to come now. It's, you know, it's kind of, a, I'm working because I do a good job. And my boss says, hey, work a little harder and I'll pay you a little more. That never happened to me before. I don't know about you guys, they wanted me out of there. Everything's changed now. And I wonder sometimes if folks are coming and they're not seeing whatever that is that can change that, that becomes ultimately something we'll call conscious contact. My life was driven when I got here by some pretty nutty thinking. Probably none of you guys experienced that. You guys probably came in here and you were fine from day one and everything's good. I was a little nuts, all right? I was a lot nuts, but I didn't know I was nuts. And there's nothing worse than a nuts guy than who doesn't know that he's nuts. That's why I, I often caution new people, if you're newer, you, you come into the meetings and we encourage you to share. You know, you're new, say something. And when you're done sharing, when you're pretty new, what do we always say? Keep coming back. When you hear that, that means, hey, they're nuts. <laughs> You know, we just said something nuts, but it's okay. Keep coming back. You know, that's the real truth when you hear that sort of thing. Now, if you're sober two, three, four years, and every time you share in a meeting, people are saying, keep coming back, you're still nuts. All right, there's something's not quite working. Now, I'm making fun of it. It's not exactly the truth, but it's darn close. Of course, then whenever I do one of these things at the end, somebody always yells, keep coming back to me. But... <laughs> What are we being asked to consider, guys, when we come in here? I don't know about you, but the, the first thing I was being asked to consider is, was step one, which I didn't understand. 
I kind of thought when I came here, you were going to teach me either how not to drink or how to get away with drinking. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to learn in here. And you taught me something entirely different. Isn't it interesting that Alcoholics Anonymous from the outside looks like a non-drinking program? But it isn't. Alcoholics Anonymous is a life-changing program that I can change to the degree that I don't have to drink anymore. We don't have 12 steps of not drinking. If we did, number one would probably be don't go to relatives' houses around the holidays. You know, stay. <laughs> Stay away from that. We would have 12 different things we're supposed to do to avoid alcohol. Stay away from Anyone in here ever tried? You can't avoid it. I just drove 70-something miles, and I can't tell you how many billboards and radio ads. And, and by the way, thank you for inviting me tonight, particularly tonight, so I have something else to do because I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, and my season ended in week two. Now, there's no other Dallas Cowboys fans in here, probably Eagles and probably mostly Eagles fans. You guys get the, you still have a season. I don't, so I'm really glad I get to stand here and talk instead of watching that horrific football team. But then again, I prefer professional football. You guys are a little different, but the... <clears throat> you remember what I said about the crazy thinking, all right? Yeah, okay, all right. One in every crowd. The Fresh Air group is starting to sound inviting at, at this point. But I came in here, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't a, 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 a not drinking sort of thing. You know what they convinced me in step one? If you're newer, consider this. It might be nuts, but they didn't say step one is don't drink to me. You know what they said step one is? You will drink. That's the nature of alcoholism. You needed to decide if you're like us or not. Here's what we found out. When we're drinking, we always keep drinking. Nature of alcoholism. And when we stop for some period of time, what happens? We always resume drinking. So when you got to drink when you're drinking, and you always resume drinking when you're not drinking, you're powerless over alcohol. That's not a don't drink message. That's a you're going to drink message. My sponsor broke it down a little cleaner for me. Some of you know how he puts it. You know what he did? He looked me right in the eye and he said, basically, you're screwed. <laughs> you're screwed. You are going to drink again unless something dramatic changes. This guy is going to drink again. It may almost sound sacrilegious to say it, but I really believe in my own case, one man's view that I could have gone to 6,000 AA meetings in 3,000 days. And had I not worked your 12-step program, I don't think so. I don't think I would have been able to do it. The reason I wouldn't be able to do it is because sobriety would have sucked so bad that I'd go back to drinking even though I knew how bad that was. I prefer it to sobriety. I'm screwed. I am going to drink because I can't be comfortable in life without drinking. The good news is that's what the program's for. The 12-step program, in my view, is to allow me to be comfortable enough, no matter what's going on in my life, to be comfortable enough that I needn't take a drink of alcohol. I guess I can. I could do it tonight, but I needn't take it. Everyone in this room knows what it's like to need to take a drink of alcohol. We all know what that's like. Even when we don't even want it, we have to take it. I need to do something to change that. So he said, basically, in step one, I'm screwed. So if you're newer, take full advantage of the fellowship. Hit the meetings. Do, do everything. Meet all the folks you can. But please try not to fall into that trap so many of us do where we rely on the fellowship feels great when you come in here. I don't know about you guys, but nobody else was saying to me, come on in, hang around. Let me pick you up. Let me, let me give you a ride there. That isn't what they were saying to me when I, before I came here. Everybody's like, ew, no, no, no. Don't tell them when the party is. All right? They don't want that. But I come here, and you guys are welcoming me, and, all, and it feels fantastic. So I get in here, and I'm abstinent from the, from the substance alcohol. They got me away from that stuff in the, in the medical room there in the hospital, strapped to the gurney for a few days. Anybody else do that? You're strapped to this thing, and there's stuff coming out of the walls and everything. And they had these really, these nurse, this one nurse, when I was in, um, 
the, the, the uh, hospital there for quite a while in Don Christiana Hospital, I would scream and yell that stuff was crawling all over me. You know, the, what do they call them, like the DTs or whatever? I don't know what it was, but there was stuff crawling on me. And she would come in and she'd say, there isn't anything there. Will you quit disturbing the other patients? And she'd go out of the room. And I'd just I'd like this. And then a little while later, they'd come back, the critters. And there was this other nurse. She'd come in. And you know what she'd do? She'd brush them off me. <laughs> she'd just brush them off. And I'd be fine for an hour or two. Which one of those women do you think went to Al-Anon? Huh? <laughs> that was my introduction to those guys over there. I love that program, but let's be honest, where would they be without us? Huh? <laughs> All right, so I come, in. it feels so good here, and I feel like welcomed and like I belong, but I can be tricked. You know, I'm still bonkers. My thinking, my, what guides my life is still a mess. And I can be tricked into, with the fellowship and some willpower and some peer pressure, because I like hanging out with you so much and I have no other options. I kind of know, can't drink if I'm going to hang out with these guys. I get fooled into thinking that's recovery. And it takes a bunch of us down the wrong way. It isn't recovery. Here's another thing that can happen to us when we're newer. We stay sober for a while on abstinence, on willpower, on this fellowship, and on willpower. And what happens out there in life? I'm, what I found early on, the old boss starts saying, you can come back to work. And the wife says, you can see the kids again. And the paper boy starts bringing the paper. And the neighbor starts waving. And I start thinking, wow. This is recovery. A lot of the negative circumstances kind of go away. And I think, I'm changing. Am I? They're changing. The paper boy changed. The wife changed. The boss changed. The neighbor changed. Did I? Frankly, I'm still in here. It doesn't take much. There's a thing in the, in the big book somewhere that says we can match calamity with serenity. You ever read that line? I love that line. But nobody defines calamity. I can have calamities from the broken shoe case, or shoelace all the way up to the end of the world, and they all affect me personally. So I don't know what calamity is, but it doesn't take me much to knock me off my rocker again. So I think I'm recovered based on a lot of meetings, based on some fellowship, based on some willpower, based on the peer pressure, based on the things changing around me. Some describe that as the pink cloud. It usually means other things are changing, the old pink cloud. And I start thinking, well, this must be it. Then something rocks me. And here's the sad part, um, then my sobriety can get so uncomfortable. It's hideous, it's terrible. And you know what I'm gonna say? This doesn't work. This doesn't, they're lying. This just doesn't work. I feel worse than I did then. Then I'm in big trouble, big, big, big trouble. That's why I think the 12 steps are so neat because they're designed to change this for me. They're designed, the fellowship side of it, the meetings and all, they support me while I'm going through this change. You guys can tell me what to do. If I'm screwed, I better get unscrewed. So guys like, I know in the, in the program and people who came in here before me, they can sit down with me and they can say, damn, whoa, whoa, set down, settle down. We used to be screwed too. They'll even tell us our stories, their drinking stories and stuff, and you can hear that they were just like me. They were screwed just like me. Whenever they were drinking, they keep drinking. If they could stop for some period of time, they always resume drinking. They recognize that they were screwed, totally screwed, and they found something to do about it and they're not screwed anymore. They call that step two. So I'm gonna start changing my thinking based on their experience. Step one's on my experience. Step two's on your experience. I don't have any yet. I decide to come to believe I changed my thinking based on what you guys are doing out there. And I hear people that drank the way I drank, that hated sobriety the way I do, and yet you seem reasonably comfortable this time. Some of you seem reasonable. The ones who aren't, I tend to sponsor. You know, it's just, just, just the way it works. So it changes, and I start seeing this sec second step. So now I got a choice, guys, when, when I'm newer. Stick with the fact that I'm screwed and hope for the best. Stick to the fact that you guys got unscrewed and got out of this mess, which is going to look more attractive to the guy that's like this. I want out of this. I just don't know how to do it. You guys do. And they would tell me, okay, what is it, like door number one? And door number two, choose. Make a decision between the two of them. They call it step three. Make a decision. 
Which way do you want to go? You want to keep going your way? Go right ahead. Go right ahead. You want to do it our way? You might have to do some stuff. We didn't just go from that to okay, mad, matching calamity with serenity by just hoping for the best. It didn't work that way. My thinking got so screwed up. What does all this have to do with conscious contact? Everything. Before AA started, before all these steps and everything came to be, before they were written, there were a lot of times through human history that certain individuals would find that life wasn't as comfortable as they'd like it to be. They thought there must be something we could be doing spiritually to live more comfortably. They weren't necessarily trying to get away from alcohol or get away from some substance or anything like that. They just realized there must be a better way of living. They had a lot of different spiritual approaches they would use, and a lot of those different groups with spiritual approaches ended up influencing what it is we're asked to do here, if we'd like to do it. There was a guy, <coughs> excuse me, you can read about it in the big book, but there was this business guy, he was a really successful man, wealthy man, and he went all the way to Europe to get treated because he couldn't stop drinking, there was no AA. Imagine what those guys did pre before that, in the 1930s, wasn't that long ago, some of you guys are a little younger, that was not that long ago. I was born in the 50s, so only 20-something years before I was even born, there was, there was no real options. It's a true story. My grandfather, I'm a Native American on one side of my family, and I'm Irish Catholic on the other side of my family. So basically just pour in a little alcohol and shake, you know, and you got a whole bunch of alcoholics. We're all alcoholic. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, is Cherokee, bad drunk, bad, bad drunk. So I'm sure at some point somebody said to him, you need to go get help with that drinking. Well, where's he going to go? It's 1920s. There's nowhere to go. Now, my grandmother developed what, one, of, one of the first methods of, of stopping drinking my grandmother developed. She got tired of him coming home drunk and beaten in those days where they lived and everything. They carried guns. They'd shoot to play. It was crazy down the Appalachian Mountains. It was nuts down there. So she got tired of it. My mom remembers it before she passed. She would remember that as a girl that my grandmother got sick of my grandfather coming home drunk with no money and roughing up everybody and being crazy. So she waited one night behind the screen door of the shack they lived in, dirt floor shack, with a cast iron skillet in her hands. Now, you guys all remember the cast iron skillets? I mean, I don't know what these things weigh, but it's got to be 20, 30 pounds at least. But she'd had enough. So sure enough, my grandfather came home drunk as a skunk, walked through that screen door, and she hit him in the back of the head with that cast iron skillet with everything she had. He never drank another day in his life. <laughs> he never really completed a full sentence either. <laughs> but they didn't, they didn't have any other way of doing it. It worked. My mother remembers him lying on the floor. In the, he really never drank again. It's true. But he wasn't, uh, he wasn't quite there for the rest of... Uh, for the rest of his life, but it is a true story. Anyway, we had nowhere to go. So here's this business guy, and he's over in Europe. He's getting treated by a doctor, and here's what the doctor said. He goes, what I've been trying, he, he kept failing with this guy. He kept failing. He's treating him for a long period of time. He goes, here's the thing. He goes, everyone in, in the world, all humans, have things that guide them through life. Thinking. This is what was guiding. Remember what was guiding me, the, 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 the anger and the hatred and, and, the, and the fear? and the shame and all these things. I'm betting a lot of people in this room know just exactly what that was like. And that was guiding my life. Well, this particular guy must have things guiding his life. And the doctor who tried to help him couldn't help him with medicine. But he said, what I've been trying to do, he says, that is trying to bring about a change in the words he used were the ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were the guiding force of your life. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were the guiding force of his life. My ideas, emotions, and attitudes back then, pretty easy to read. I'll bet you everybody in this room, just before we came in here, kind of easy to know the ideas that are driving our lives aren't so good. Ideas, what, what's an idea? What I believe to be true, right? What I, it's all their fault. I got a raw deal. If only they'd leave me alone. I'd stop drinking if only I could exchange wives, get a different job, move to over there. If they'd just get out of here, if the boss would die, whatever it was, I was thinking, you know, that would solve it all. But he said, I, have, I wasn't able to help you, sir. I'm just not able to rearrange that stuff for you. So the patient, of course, is saying, oh, God, what, what, do I, what do I do? He says, well, there's been cases 
of people who are able to have this spiritual comfort provided somehow through, he used the word, religious kinds of means. I can't help you. So this ma uh, businessman would come home to the United States and he would link up with a group, a group of people who were just trying to find more comfortable living. They weren't trying to quit drinking. They weren't trying to get off of whatever the substance of the day was. They were just trying to live more comfortably by adjusting their ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were the driving forces of their lives. This guy joined that group, and they helped him do that through a little process. A lot of that process is present in our 12 steps now. And he was able to have comfortable living for the rest of his life because he was different things were driving him. When I got here, the things that were driving me in life, the thinking that was driving me in life, there is absolutely no way I could be comfortable and sober at the same time. And that's what I'm shooting here for. I'm looking to be serene. You want to have some fun in AA? You know, AA, we think it's a not drinking program because we always say to somebody, well, how long sober are you? Or how long sober are you? Or how long are you sober? And then when they say it, it that's how we measure the success. You know, if I step up here tonight and I said 22 years, and if there's somebody down there with two months, they're probably thinking, wow, that's successful. That's, that's what I'm looking to do. I want to do that many years. We measure it by that way. But is that really the right way to measure it? Instead of asking people how long you're consecutively sober, why don't we ask them how many days they're consecutively serene? Let's ask them. I ask my sponsees all the time, and they usually leave me the next day, but uh, <laughs> thin them out. Uh, how, how often are we, wouldn't it be nice to be consecutively serene, no matter what's going on, these holiday times, all this kinds of stuff, to just be kind of okay, no matter what. You're standing up here talking and something falls on the floor and it doesn't rock you at all, that kind of thing. <laughs> you'd think you'd take better care of the speakers, but I, uh, so they had methods that people would employ spiritual methods to get more comfortable with everyday living. I would ask any one of us in this room, if we're, which guy has or girl has the better odds of remaining sober, the one who is spiritually comfortable all the time or the one who's still running around like this? It's very, very easy to see the more spiritually comfortable I can get, the more likely I don't need to introduce something into my body to alter me makes perfect sense. So we borrowed all these ideas from these guys and we put together this little 12-step type thing where we can get to that spiritual comfort. And that first two or first three steps is how we're introduced to that and then we get to decide. But when I came in and I was raised in buildings like this once a week, I had a church and I had a God and I had all that stuff, but that was long gone and I resented that as well. That was all part of the stay away from me. And then they started saying stuff like I had to, I had to have a God in my life. And, or they, see, they didn't say God. You know what they said? Higher power. You know, oh, okay. You know, like, like they're going to fool us, you know, when we get in here. And I didn't understand it. And I didn't understand it because I thought that they were going to say, here's the God. This is the one. You got to line up with it. Fortunately, I was with the right bunch of folks who did no such thing. I remember my sponsor saying that when you come into Alcoholics Anonymous, we will make no effort whatsoever to create a definition of God. What we will try to do is create a need for God as we as individuals understand God. My understanding of this whole God thing is so different than it was when I first got here today. It's not even funny. And I can tell you it works. Boy, does it work. For me individually, just one guy standing up here. Now, to some of you in the room, I'm sure any, any decent-sized group of Alcoholics Anonymous members is going to have some earlier people, some later people, and it's going to have some folks who, who usually are going to say something like, I don't get the God angle. I just don't get that angle. Or can that really be true? I would ask you folks to relax, and I'll tell you why I would ask you to relax. And I'll tell you what that might have to do with conscious contact. If we went around this room right now, and I asked each of you to tell your story, your drinking story, would we not have 
I don't know how many people in here, 100 and something people, would we not have 100 and something rather distinct, different stories? We would, right? But if I said, all right, forget that, we don't have time for that. If we went around the room and we just asked each individual to pick one word that described what it was like when we were out there, by the time we got to the eighth or 10th or 12th person, we'd be repeating the same words, would we not? We would have commonality very quickly. It's what bonds us, that commonality. Somebody's going to say I was angry. Somebody's going to say I was resentful. Somebody's going to say I was ashamed. Somebody's going to say I was guilty. And then we'll get different variations of the same words, perhaps, but we won't get far into the group that we're going to find common ground and none of us are going to argue it. If we came in the next night and we said, okay, we got a group of 100 and some people, could we go one by one and everyone stand up and describe your understanding of God? We would have a hundred and some very distinct, different understandings of God, would we not? But if we went around and just said, can you give me a one word characteristic of if there were a God, how that God would be to you? And I'll tell you what, by the time we got to 10 or 12 people, we'd be repeating the same words. We'd find commonality that fast just based on what our human being's expectation of God-like qualities might be. Immediately, try it in a group someday. Do it at the party with your relatives this summer, or this <laughs> Christmas. Say, okay guys, we're gonna find commonality of God now. No, we won't get invited next year, which could be some benefit to that, I suppose. But you try it. We don't have to define this. Maybe someday we will. Maybe someday we'll have a very, very comfortable understanding of what God means to us as individuals. But what if we just start looking at what God means as characteristics? That's what we're being asked to do in 12-step recovery, just to kind of scratch the surface a little bit. And you might say, well, are you telling me that this ideas, emotions, and attitudes thing can actually be guided by some spirit in the sky, some God? And a lot of new guys are going, new women too, are going, whoa, that's, no, it's me. Say, so, okay, try this. I've asked so many groups over the years this little question, and I've never yet found any significant amount of people who didn't agree with this. Has this ever happened to you guys? You're about to do something. You're about to take an action. And just as you're about to take the action, out of nowhere, in the back of your head, something says, don't do it, don't do it. Or you're just about to say something, you know, and you're not email, boy, when they're gone, they're gone, you know. When <laughs> but you're just about to say, and you're, and you're like, and in the back, some, something, what is that? Says, all right, don't, no, don't go there. Has everyone in this room had that happen to them at one time or another? That's guidance, folks. I don't care what we call it. It's within us and it's guidance. Some would call that an unconscious contact with God. So the argument is that, is there some God guidance there? It's in all of us. The argument probably is, can I tap it? Can I get to it? It's already there for all of us. It's a wonderful thing. So we sit and we talk to the newcomer and we say, we ask him, he said, is that, well, yeah, that does happen, but that doesn't count. It's like random. It just pops up. You notice it's always a good thing. I'm never about to take an action and the little voice says, let's go rob the gas station. <laughs> that never happens. It always seems to be something, something good to make my life more spiritually comfortable. Don't do that. Or we do it, we take the action, and then the little voice, the guidance, the ideas, emotions, and attitudes, whatever they are, they say something like, now why did you do that? You ever have that one? I have that a lot. Why did you do, why did you say that? Did that really have to, if you're new, why did you say that? We tend to say things in early recovery that we wish we could take back. I have a trick for you if you're new. You can write this down. Just before you say anything, ask yourself three questions. Does it have to be said? Does it have to be said now? And does it have to be said by me? And if you can say yes to all three of those, go right ahead. I found out that I've been very quiet for a lot of years, you know, all of a sudden. It's changed for me. So this 
guidance, this whatever it is we want to call it, it seems to be there. And I talk to the new person, they always admit, yeah, I guess it's there. Okay, end of argument that there's something there. The argument seems to be, well, yeah, but it's random. It just pops up out of nowhere. And I'll tell them, what would you say if I told you it's there all the time? It is always there, 100% always there. And you're going to say, no, that's crazy. I, I, I don't hear it. It's like, the, it's like the radio signals out here that get sent from those big things. And you go over to Philly, they've got those big things, and they're shooting that radio signal out there, right? And sometimes it comes in real good, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes when it goes out a little bit, we go over to the radio or the tuner or whatever, and we, we turn a couple of little knobs and tools to kind of zero it in. It's there. It's just a little sketchy. So we have some tools to kind of tune it in a little bit. Same thing with 12-step recovery, only we're going to use things like prayer, we're going to use things like meditation, we're going to use things like service to others, and we're going to tune that whole God thing in. It's already there, they've already admitted they hear it, just randomly. So we go back and forth usually with the newcomer, and usually it's decided they'll say something like, well, yeah, I guess you can hear it all the time, or lots of the time, but I simply can't. I say, why is that? And they will inevitably say something to the effect of, it's like something's blocking it. Yes. Welcome to step four. It's like something's blocking it. And the spiritual comfort process that we borrowed from those long before Alcoholics Anonymous came along said, hey, let's capture on a piece of paper what's blocking it. Let's see what's going on. Maybe once we know what's going on, maybe then we're going to know what to tweak, and so we can hear that signal more often. We sit down, we do this little inventory, and we discuss it with another person. These things doubt predate us way back. Spiritual comfort. Spiritual comfort. So we sit and we do these little exercises and we write some things down and we talk to somebody else and we identify the stuff that's blocking the perfect signal. The ideas, emotions, and attitudes that are guiding forces of our life that can change my manner of living, my design for living, allow me to be comfortable without alcohol no matter what's going on in life, maybe even matching calamity with serenity, is right in front of me. I just need to remove some stuff. Isn't it funny in AA we think we have to get some stuff? We've got to kind of remove some stuff. It's like meeting attendance. I was told early on, don't go to a meeting to get anything. So that's odd. My sponsor said, never go to a meeting to get. Only go to a meeting to give. It's another one of those trick things because it sounds wacko in the beginning. You ever had a bad day or something's up or money problems or boyfriend problems or girlfriend problems or car problems and you're going to go to the meeting because you're going to get help with it? Do you ever walk out of there feeling like you did? No. I get resentments. I go out there and say, please give me advice about money. Somebody does and I hate him for it because he's wrong, right? What I really wanted was his money. <laughs> I never get what I go in there to, to get. It doesn't work that way. I just go to give. I always go to give. And let me tell you, if you're newer, when you get home from work on a Wednesday afternoon and you're kind of tired and you say, I'm supposed to go to my meeting, but you know, I feel pretty good. I don't really need to get anything tonight. You can stay home. But if you get home on a Wednesday and you're kind of tired and you just feel you don't really want to go out, it's a little harder to say to yourself, I don't feel like giving anybody anything tonight. A little bit harder. Just consider it. Your sponsors may disagree. It's worked for me really, really well. I go there to give. So we sit down and we look at these things and we decide what's blocking it. How are we living? What ideas, emotions, and attitudes are guiding us now that are in the way from going from an unconscious contact to a conscious contact? And we're asked to consider that. Then we hit steps six and seven, my favorite steps. There's guys in this room that know. I, I just love these steps. And it took me a few years to understand steps six and seven. I kind of thought they were like really not that important. They don't have a lot. You look in the, you guys read the big book. You ever seen that big book? And in there, just like a couple little paragraphs. And it was the longest time before I realized that the two little paragraphs are the summation of everything in the book up till then. If I looked at it that way, I was like, ooh, this is pretty important. You know? Later on, they'd write another book. And in there, they say, these are the steps that separate the men from the boys. You girls weren't allowed in yet. We knew you'd screw the whole thing up. So we. <laughs> There was one driver early, early in AA, there was one guy that thought women in AA is going to be a disaster. We really want to avoid that. You might have heard of the guy. What was his name? Uh, Dr. Bob. That was his name. He, he didn't think you ladies were the problem. He knew we would be the problem. So he said, oh, we don't want those women in here because there really aren't any women alcoholics anyway, are there? You know, Just stay home and cook and do those things. Different world. 
Obviously, it's changed, and boy, has it changed now. But we're, we're being asked, when we look at these things, this men from the boys, this is where we decide, guys, if we want to recover into comfortable sobriety, comfortable living, or kind of stay on the fence. This is key to me. It's the most important part of the whole program, and we miss it. We miss it a lot. If we're going to approach our program and make it about staying away from alcohol, has anyone ever tried to stay away from alcohol? That's a miserable existence. So we stay away from it. So we put some stuff in place. Oh, I'm not going to go there because they drink there. And I'm not going to go over here. And I'm not going to drive there. And I'm going to get rid of all my friends. They always say that. You're going to, what is it they say? Change people's places and things and become a hermit and all that. Uh, we do have to change some people's places and things. We, we certainly do. It's very easy to do, though. I'll give you another little hint out of the sponsor book. It's a simple one. We all have cell phones today. Take, when, you, when you come into recovery, if you're newer, erase your message and record a new message. It's very simple. Just do this. Just record a new one. Say, hello, this is Dan. I can't get to the phone right now. I'm busy changing people, places, and things. Please leave a message. If I don't call back, you're one of them. Huh? <laughs> it's simple. It's clean. All right, just, it really works. So anyway, so, so here we are. We're at the six and seven step, guys. And you know what we get to decide now? Do we want to stick with the self way or do we want to stick with the God way? Do we want to hope for the best of a in unconscious contact with God that's periodic, maybe there, maybe it won't be. Other people seem to be able to get it. Or do we want to work toward having that steady signal all the time that can lead to a way of thinking that actually works? That's what we're being asked to do. What if our thinking was completely driven at all moments by those God characteristics that we went around the room and named? If we went around the room and named God characteristics, you're usually, or drunk characteristics, what are we going to hear? Selfish, self-centered, angry, mad, right? And then the God side, we're going to hear things like forgiving and loving and all these wonderful things. What if we just start living on that side instead of this side? You know what that's called? Being guided by God principles. That's what call, is called a conscious contact. And then we get into that step 11 where we're asked to get in there and use the, the tools to tune it in a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. That word conscience, if you look that up, just means awareness. It's really all it means. Being aware that it's there, not just it pops in now and again. Being aware, where is it? You know what I found out over some practice? Not only will the guidance, if you will, the God-driven type characteristic guidance come in, we can go get it. That's the coolest part. You ever see, you're in a situation, you're not sure what to do. We all face this, you know. Oh, I got this family thing, I got this work thing, I just really don't know what to do. Blah, 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 blah. And then we all, what we usually say is, oh, I took my will back. I don't know how we do that. I'm wondering if it isn't just that we, we take these situations and we don't stop and take a minute and go get it. If the junk's out of the way, the guidance is there, let's just go get it. Maybe just be quiet and wait, it comes. That's what the whole prayer and meditation thing's for. You ever read that? I love it in the 12 and 12. Um, they use that sample prayer, the St. Francis prayer. You ever look at that thing? But I mean really look at it. I use it a lot. We look at that little prayer, and we realize that that little prayer is the same thing we just went around the room and said one side doesn't work and this side does work. Self-characteristics of the drunken life versus God characteristics of a comfortable spiritual life. We realize that that little prayer is six, step six on one side and step seven on the other side. The stuff that doesn't work, me, 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 me. You ever come in, you know when we come into AA early on? And I even mentioned, I said it, you feel like, we feel like we belong, right? It just feels good. I can go to any meeting anywhere and I get to go all over the place. And it always feels really, really good. And for the longest time, I thought, rather selfishly, that the reason it felt good is because you understand me. My self-centeredness says, I love it here with you guys because you understand me. You know what I found out as I grow spiritually? That isn't what gives me the comfort. You know what's giving me spiritual comfort? Because I understand you. Because I'm interested in understanding you. I got to tell you, folks, some of you guys, I don't want to hang out with you but I understand you, all right? It's, it's just different. 
So I look at this St. Francis prayer, and I said, this is, this is that ideas, emotions, and attitudes flip-flopped. This is the way, if I can actually have my life driven by this kind of thinking versus what I used to think, you know what happens? That little world, it grows, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And then I get to go out of here. In the beginning, I'm in here. This is all I can handle, an hour a day. I got one hour of comfort a day and 23 hours of chaotic mess per day. But as I get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better, I do what the literature suggests. It says, hey, can we take that stuff we're practicing in here and it works so well from this little tiny world of ours and take it out into that big world of ours? It shocks me. You know what I did recently? I actually went to a bank and got another mortgage. Now, I almost went to jail. I had to tax things. I had all this debt and this, that. And now I got banks saying, can we loan you money? It's just amusing when you really think about it because I actually pay it back. You know, when I take taxes out of your paycheck, you know what I do now? It's really neat. I send them into the government. You know, we didn't used to do that kind of thing. Everything, if I can, to the degree I can, I try to drive by that God side characteristic. I don't get caught up in whether my definition of God and yours is different. I don't try to tell any newcomer what God needs to be or how he needs to interact with that God. All we try to do is open up to the idea that it's already there. And if it's blocked, it's me. And through this little step process that we borrowed from people who are looking for spiritual comfort, I can become a guy that can be reasonably comfortable no matter what's going on. And when the tough things do come, I said it earlier in the, in the evening, I was expert at when bad things happen, making it worse. The young men I'm concerned about right now are out there making decisions. They're going to make bad things a lot worse. What if the things that happen bad, if you will, instead of adding anger and adding fear and all those things that make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, what if the bad thing, that's unmanageable. I can't deal with that. But what if the thing that is bad happens and I add these God characteristics? What if I look at it from a more loving way? What if I ask for help? What if I go out and get somebody to help me with the thing? What if I make the phone call? What if I drive some new knucklehead to the meeting? You know what happens with that thing that's unmanageable and it's too much for me to handle? It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and it's perfect. I can handle it perfectly well. It turns out that things that go on in life I can handle if I only have the spiritual comfort tools in front of me. That's what 12-step recovery to me is all about. We take this fellowship, we embrace it, we have a ball with it, we have sponsors, we go to dances, we do, we do all these crazy, we have a ball. And then we take a way to change the thinking that got us into this bind so that the ideas and the emotions and the attitudes that follow them can allow us to be comfortable regardless of what's going on in life. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe if we can get to that point, we are completely now unscrewed we don't need to resume drinking. We don't need to alter our reality. As a matter of fact, in the back of the book, it says something about we can have a profound alteration in our reaction to life through a 12-step pro pro process, as opposed to a profound alteration in our reaction to life through alcohol. This isn't a non-drinking program. It's a life-changing program. And life can be fantastic. Great stuff can happen. It takes time. It takes work doesn't seem to happen by osmosis. My own daughter, some of you guys know, almost lost her a number of years ago. She's 22 years old when she finally came in here. I say finally, 22. You can get beat up pretty good by the age of 22 these days out there. And, and where she was and where she's been, I'm not even going to get into. But in two weeks, she's going to celebrate 10 continuous years of sobriety. And this young girl coming into the program from where she was, she's now a mom. She met a guy in the program, almost killed him. They ended up getting married. They had, they've given me two wonderful grandchildren, which is what it's all about anyway. You know, all these wonderful, wonderful things can occur for us. We're not all going to win the lottery. We're not all going to have the fairy tale. We were talking about that earlier. But our sobriety, our recovery, can be comfortable to a degree that I don't know that we've ever dreamed possible. And if it's like that for you as it is for me, we needn't take a drink of alcohol. Thank you for having me. Happy holidays to everybody.
Well, thank Dan for coming out. Awesome job. Uh, we usually get in the line and thank him afterwards. It's uh, customary to thank the speaker. Uh, next week we will be here. Jim C is coming in. He's either going to have a it's the day after Christmas. He's going to have a, either a pretty tumultuous story or he's going to have a pretty beautiful story. Uh, join us on that. Um, Peter M. is coming here. Uh, we're doing a 12-step big book workshop January 9th, 2016. It will be in this room, 10 a.m. to 3 in the afternoon. It's completely free. It comes with a free lunch. Um, he's going to take, you, uh, take us all and, and give us uh, his experience, and it's pretty powerful. And, and he's coming up from Florida, so it's, it's something that's good. An event, not the mix. We've got a nice way of closing. Uh, thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week.